how long before it's going to be ready? It's ready now? Okay, good. So what, what end up, ends up happening is they take those colors and they put them together, and you end up with this swatch of, of the puzzle, but it's not really connected to anything, right? It's just kind of like, and then you keep putting the puzzle together, and then all of a sudden somebody goes, I think that fits here, and then you fit it in. And so <clears throat> this morning, if, we, if you recall in a little bit of review, we, uh, in, a, in a couple of the scriptures, we talked about John being in prison and how that Jesus had gone from Cain of Galilee, then to either to Capernaum and then to Nazareth and then back to Capernaum or into Nazareth and back to Capernaum. And then while he's there, he hears that John is in jail. And so now uh, we, we've uh, neglected and a little bit by design because in all reality, there's a component of, of, the, of the life of Jesus and the walking with Jesus that isn't spoken of. Is it still there? Okay, good. That isn't spoken of by the other Gospels, and it is a trip that Jesus takes to Jerusalem during the Passover season, during Passover time. And so that's where we're at, and think of it like that all of a sudden now there's these components, and there's these activities, and we see there's going to be the discussion of that uh, Paul ha or that uh, Nicodemus has with Jesus, and there is then Jesus meeting the woman at the well in Samaria, and these are a little part of it that nobody else in the Scripture talks about, and it's during that time when Jesus has left Capernaum and has now gone to Jerusalem during the Passover season and is now headed back up. Then he'll head back up into Galilee and then end up back in. Capernaum. And so we've already prayed, and so let's use our, uh, our verse in Luke chapter 4, verse 31 as our jump-off point. You can see on the map that it, it shows uh, a little bit of the local area, and then on this map you can see the lines that actually do delineate the travel that, that Jesus has made from uh, Nazareth to Betharba, then into the wilderness, and then back up to Cana, then to Capernaum. And now we can see all the way down that long trip to Jerusalem. And that's where we're going to be at this morning. And so in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he taught them, in, uh, taught them on the Sabbath days. And then John, chapter 2, now verse 12, it says, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, and this is after, contextually, this is after he's been in Cana of Galilee, and now they've gone back over into Capernaum with his brethren. When we read this, uh, before he went into Nazareth and then came back, he says, and that he was there not many days. And then at verse 13, it says, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem he says, and found in the temple those that sold ox and sheep and doves and the changers of money uh, sitting. And you know what's interesting is some commentators uh, take, uh, uh, talk about this activity and this, this saying of John in a way that, uh, and I saw one commentary that basically said that John didn't really care about timelines. He was just really getting activity and he was just talking about certain things and uh, but because when you get into the later parts of the other gospels it talks about Jesus going in and kicking out the money changers and he goes in and, and, and into the temple and you know what I think he did it twice I think that's what happened here when you look at it remember that it's it's important his ministry was three and a half years long and when you, you don't, don't think that Jesus wasn't doing something every day to promote the kingdom. That every day he was healing people. Every day. And we're just, we honestly, when you think about all four gospels, when you really look at it, it was like, it's like a, it's like a, a postage stamp of all of the activity that Jesus did during his uh, time here on the earth. And then it said, and... Uh, when he had made a scourge of small cord, it says he drove them all out of the temple and, uh, and the sheep and the oxen 
and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And one of the things that you notice that in this instance where he, he created the cord, he doesn't, he, no other, none of the other gospels, not that it didn't happen, but none of the other gospels talk about him using a cord to drive them out. And then in verse 16 it says, And said unto them that sold doves, Take these hence, and make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And you know what? We have to be careful, don't we, at the house of God. You know, we have to remember this is the house of prayer. This is the house of God. This is the place where people come for healing and for help and for, for care. And it is not a place where, uh, it's, it's not a place where, uh, a place of merchandise. It's not a place where people are, uh, come to uh, be forced or, or wrangled into uh, buying or doing business. This is the Lord's business. And you know what his businesses are? It's soul business. Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which, that which was lost. And we see here, this is the temple. This is a, uh, and this should, yeah, nice. It's actually a video, a short video clip. And if you, and from a bird's eye view, you can see as the trail goes down, this was what it would have been like for Jesus to get there and to walk up the streetway to that particular area. And I knew that was going to happen. So for, I wasn't able to be successful in getting the uh, getting it to stop and to shut down but I knew that I could do this pass it by and so we see that uh, that that and you can see I actually and there's a uh, I'll have a picture up on your outline at the bottom that's the temple and the temple was uh, built originally during Jesus's time a little bit of the history was that <clears throat> before the temple was built the, the, the tabernacle of God was a tent. If you remember, it was a tent. They carried it. It was a, it was a uh, temporary habitat. They would haul it in. They would, when, the, when God would stop, they would stop and they would set it up. And so when David then became the king, and remember David's heart, he loved the Lord, and he said, how can I live in this beautiful house and, and, and my Lord lives in tent? And he purposed in his heart that he would build a temple for, for God. But God said, uh, can't let you do it because you're a bloody man and, and because of the, all the blood that you shed, the violence of, of your life. And he says, but I want your son Solomon to do it. And so you know what David did? Then David went and he, gave, he came up with a whole bunch of money and all the material to support the building of the temple. <clears throat> and so think of Jerusalem. It's like in a, it's on a high area. It's a crested area. There's three different valleys that are around it. And as you, as you go up, Jerusalem was a smaller area and it did not encompass where the temple mount was. And so uh, David said, hey, we need, a, we need more room. And so he purchased, he purchased that threshing floor and they expanded it. And, and guess right what was there, this rock, right on Mount Moriah, right where Abraham offered up Isaac, and that's where the temple mount is, and that's where the temple mount, that's where the temple is built, was built. Now, we won't talk about what's in there now, but anyway. And so now in verse 17, it says, And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of the house of thine house hath eaten me up. It says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing thou, hast, or thou doest these things? And so uh, they're, they're always looking for a sign, right? What's that, what's that sign? And you know, we're that way sometimes, aren't we? Come on, God, give us an indicator here. Give us a sign. But you know what, really, for the most part, you know what he wants? He wants us to have faith. He wants us to have confidence. And he wants us to trust and to rest on his word. And, and, and this is the foundation of, of what we should be building, everything that we are and have in our lives. And so, 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. He says, Wilt thou rear it up in three days? And so look at that, that, that picture, that huge edifice, right? That, that picture at the bottom of your outline. That thing's huge. 46 years, and, and it wasn't like they just could bring in the cement mixers, right, Brother Durfee? It wasn't like they had the rock and gravel guy, hey, we need a bunch of material delivered, you know what I mean? They had to haul it in manually, and so, uh, but then this is it. That's the temple, right? Gorgeous. But he wasn't talking about the temple. You know what it says in verse 21? He says, but he spake of the temple of his body. He was talking about this temple, who he was. He says, it's going to go down. And so we, we begin, and we talked about it before, and, and, and you're going to hear me continually use this theme. And this is the, because what has happened and what's happening since Jesus came on the scene, everybody continually tries to reason or understand about the things of God carnally through the flesh they're trying to make it make sense for this time this period this world these circumstances and so in in uh in this sense they missed it didn't they he was talking about a spiritual temple he was talking about the temple of his body talking about something spiritual and what were they looking at something physical something that was carnal. And we're going to see continually that that's been the theme over and over, and it will continue to be the theme. In verse 22, it says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this unto them, and they believed the Scriptures. You see that? They believed the Scriptures. God is putting us, and he wants us to be in a position to believe the Scriptures. You know, many times, multiple times, you know what I do? I just get the Bible, and I find a promise. I find something that I need from His Word, and I put my finger on there, and I say, you know what your Word says? This is what your Word says. This is what your Word says. This is what your Word says. I remind God of, and you know the safest way and the safest place to pray is in alignment with the Word of God. It all, his Word is already saying what is true, and when we line up and when we have confidence and we say, I'm not asking anything amiss, but according to the, to, to the word of God, boy, do you start getting prayers answered. Do you see the power of prayer? It says, but it says that they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name. He says, when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, what's interesting, I want to, I'm going to, I want to make a point here because a little while later, Jesus is going to say that this is the second miracle that Jesus did in Galilee. <clears throat> and you're thinking, well, wait a minute. It's, it's alluding to that he's done a bunch of miracles here. We already know that he's, he's doing a bunch of stuff. And so it's, Remember that he's, it's going to be related to when he got back. Is he in Jerusalem now or is he in Galilee? He's in yeah, he's in Jerusalem, right? So when the miracle he's, he's doing in Jerusalem, when he gets to Galilee and he says, now this is the second miracle that he did in Galilee, well, that's a specific time. Now I'm in a specific place and I'm, and I'm picking up miracling again and that's going to be right here in Galilee and it's, it's, my, it's my second go at it. That's what it's relating to. And I want to make, a, make that point because we're going to get there. But notice in verse 24, it says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He says, And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And, you know, that's kind of a, an odd scripture. And I've always thought that scripture was a little bit odd, just the way that it reads, Right? And just in this particular study and drilling down and looking at the Greek and finding what, what is he really trying to say there? And I mean, and, and, and obviously, it's obvious that 
uh, he knows what's in man. He knows my heart. He knows who I am. He knows my secret motives. But when you drill down and you really look at it and, and, uh, and, and reading J. Vernon McGee's co commentary, he agreed and he means this. And, and, and he said the same thing that I uh, discovered when I was looking at the Greek and the scriptures in uh, verse 24. It says, where it says Jesus did not commit himself. That word is, it's not wrongly Commit is not necessarily wrongly interpreted. It, it, it is the, the Greek word can be interpreted that. But it it's really means uh, believe. And you know what the deal is? You know what he's saying? He says Jesus did, didn't believe in them. Now if you remember then in the book of Matthew, and we'll get there, Matthew chapter 7, the Bible says that in that day many are going to come to him and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in thy name and in thy name didn't we cast out demons and in thy name do many wonderful works? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. And you know what he's saying? He says, you believe me because you saw my miracles he says, but I don't believe in you because I know what's really in your heart. And your motivation is wrong. And you say you believe, but you're really not believing to the point of being born again. Yesterday had some Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door. And you know what? They say they believe in Jesus. But you know what? I don't think Jesus believes in them. See, that's my point. Do you see? Just because somebody says they believe in Jesus, there's a whole bunch of people that believe in Jesus. Do you know the Buddhists believe in Jesus? Muslims believe in Jesus. Everybody believes in Jesus except for the atheists. But they still celebrate Christmas and they, you know what I mean? They, they, there's still silliness for them to not believe in Jesus. And the point is, it's more important for him to believe in me than for me to believe in him. Because you know what, if, I'm, if, if my faith is only me, and, and, if, and if it's about me holding on, uh, you know what, you can only hold on so long and then you're going you're gonna to slip. But hallelujah, we need him who holds on to us. Because he has the everlasting hands, the everlasting arms, the everlasting grip that keeps us. Paul himself, and Pastor talked about this a few weeks ago in his studies, Paul said, hey, listen, lest I become a castaway. You know, you, Paul was very careful to be, examine himself. Our eternity is at stake, folks. This isn't a game. It's not tiddlywinks. It's not, it's, it's, it's not something that you do haphazardly. It's not something that you do carelessly, that, uh, whether we're a Christian or not. And you know why God lets us have trials? You know why there's stuff goes on in our lives and it's not an easy road? Because what happens is a test proves whether or not you really have the knowledge and the information. That's what a test is. It's a knowledge test. You go through a lesson, you learn your ABCs, and when you can recite every ABC, you pass the test. If you miss Z, it proved that you didn't have it. And the tests of life prove our relationship with Christ. That's why it says in James, count it all joy. Because when you pass the test with an A plus, you can go, hoo hoo, he knows me. He believes in me. And so, as we need to remember, the chapters and the verses were added. They're not really a part of the original languages. So as we begin and we start reading the scriptures again, think of this, the continuity of this. He says, these people, the masses, the mob over here that believe me because I'm feeding people, I'm healing people, I'm doing all of these things that to them could just be parlay tricks. Hey, it was just like, Penn and Teller in the first century, right? They're just like, oh, this is great. This is great entertainment. Hey, let's go watch the guy from Nazareth. Let's go watch the guy from Galilee. He's got some great tricks. It's awesome. And there's food, free food. Yeah, let's go, right? And, that, and so the mob were there, 
But yet, there was a man that came. Verse 1, it says, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, or actually, technically, it should be pronounced Rabbi. And he says, We know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And you know, that's one of the signs. That's one of the validations, the verifications that he was who he said he was. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 puts it this way. How shall we escape if we neg neglect so great salvation, which at the beginning, to, uh, uh, which first began to, to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, it says, God also bearing, and I want to re remind you that italicized words are entered in for the, the flow of the, of the words, but really that should be read, God also bearing witness. Not bearing them witness, he was bearing witness of who he was. And so we have to be careful. Sometimes just take the italicized words out of your reading and you'll, it'll, all of a sudden you'll go, whoa, that makes more sense sometimes. And, uh, but it is added for the English to smooth things out. But he said, uh, he says, and God bearing witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And that was one of the badges of authority that Christ was who he said he was. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be bo born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Okay? Just like what we said earlier. Nicodemus trying to look through the eyes of humanity and Jesus having to reset the tone of the discussion. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Understand there is a difference between the two. And I'm not speaking about the water birth, the earthly birth, the fleshly birth, but I'm talking about a spiritual birth. Verse 7, marvel not that I send unto thee, you must be born again. Don't be surprised about what I'm saying that you must be born again. And so there it is, folks, as we continue in our journey, we're going to see over and over and over again the theme. Be spiritual. Get spiritual. When you are in the midst of whatever you're going through in your life, whether it's sorrow, whether it's joy, whether just keep the spiritual component in the forefront of what's going on. When you start having troubles in life, when you're going through grief, checkpoint, God, is this because there's a spiritual problem in my life? God, is this a spiritual test? Help me then and strengthen me to pass this test. But help me to be spiritual in all of my activities. Father, we thank you for your word and for instructing us, teaching us, helping us to be spiritual. Bless our intermission time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.